In this lecture, I'll be covering fiscal policy and debt. Fiscal policy refers to the federal government's use of government spending and taxation to influence the economy. And there are two main types of federal spending, discretionary spending and mandatory spending. Discretionary spending is part of the annual budget and is decided through the appropriations process of Congress and is later signed by the president. Examples of discretionary spending include spending on national defense, transportation, science, the environment, education, and certain income security programs. Almost all federal spending that affects colleges, universities, and college students is discretionary. However, Pell Grants combines mandatory and discretionary funding streams. Mandatory spending, sometimes called entitlements, is authorized by permanent laws and does not go through the appropriations process. For mandatory spending to change, a law must be repealed or a new law must be created. Examples of mandatory spending include spending on Social Security, Medicare, interest on the national debt, and certain income security programs, including SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and TEMF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. The overwhelming majority of federal spending consists of mandatory spending. Specifically, almost 70% of the current budget is mandatory spending. Legislation determines eligibility criteria for recipients, and the government funds all who are eligible, regardless of the annual cost to the Treasury. To better understand discretionary spending, it's important to be familiar with the appropriations process. The appropriations process is conducted each year. Congress is required to produce a budget resolution and 12 appropriations bills. The federal fiscal year begins on October 1st and concludes on September 30th. Emergency funding in response to natural disasters pandemics, or other catastrophes are known to occur rather frequently and occur outside of the appropriations process. The federal funding process begins with the president. The president will submit an annual budget request to Congress, typically on the first Monday of February. The budget request is formulated over a period of several months with the assistance of the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. After this, Congress responds by creating a concurrent congressional budget resolution, which includes setting the total level of discretionary funding, known as the 302A allocation. Congress is supposed to file all budget resolutions by April 15th. From this point, the funding process moves to the appropriations committees in each chamber. Appropriations is responsible for determining program-by-program -program funding levels. This task is completed through 12 separate appropriations bills, each generated by a specific subcommittee. All appropriations bills are supposed to be passed in regular order, meaning full passage of all 12 bills through both chambers, which are then signed by the President by the start of the federal fiscal year on October 1st. Failure to provide appropriations by October 1st results in a nearly complete shutdown of federal operations. Discretionary fiscal policy is aimed at increasing or decreasing aggregate demand, utilizing the tools of taxation and government spending. Changes in government spending or other components of GDP cause income and output to increase by the spending change multiplied by the spending multiplier. Remember that government spending has a larger impact on economic output at lower levels of output and less of an impact on output at higher levels of output. To reflect this, the short-run aggregate supply curve is flatter at lower levels of output and steeper at higher levels of output. The steeper the short-run aggregate supply curve, the smaller the effect of stimulus spending. Or to phrase it differently, it takes extremely large amounts of government spending to stimulate small increases in output when the short-run aggregate supply curve is steep. Changes in taxes don't have as large of an effect on GDP due to the fact that disposable income is equal to gross income minus net taxes. Recall the equation for GDP. GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And in equilibrium, injections equal leakages. I plus G plus X equals S plus T plus M. Injections are activities that increase spending in the economy, and withdrawals, or leakages, are activities that remove spending from the economy. Remember that disposable income is equal to gross income minus taxes, which is equal to consumption plus saving. When taxes increase, 
money is withdrawn from the economy's spending stream. And when taxes decrease, money is added to the economy's spending stream. However, the effect of a change in taxes on spending is dampened by a change in saving. For example, when taxes increase, some of the tax paid is taken out of saving, and when taxes decrease, some of the increase in income results in a higher level of saving. To calculate the effect of a tax change, multiply the tax change by the simple tax multiplier, given as MPC divided by 1 minus MPC. Transfer payments such as Social Security, unemployment compensation, and welfare represent a large part of mandatory spending and are written into the law. While these transfers represent a large part of the budget, they do not play a major role in discretionary fiscal policy. Instead, these programs are considered to be automatic stabilizers. If the federal government increases transfer payments, ceteris paribus, this will result in higher levels of consumption and will therefore increase aggregate demand. The inverse is true as well. Fiscal policy is further categorized as either expansionary fiscal policy or contractionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy involves increasing government spending or decreasing taxes or some combination of both to increase aggregate demand. Contractionary fiscal policy involves decreasing government spending or increasing taxes or some combination of both to decrease aggregate demand. The effects of expansionary or contractionary fiscal policy depend on the current state of the economy. Policies aimed at increasing or decreasing aggregate demand are known as demand-side policies. Demand-side fiscal policies bear trade-offs between output and unemployment and changes to the price level. For example, if a country is currently producing output below full employment output with high levels of unemployment, expansionary fiscal policy can shift aggregate demand to the right, resulting in increased output, decreased unemployment, and higher prices. Policies aimed at increasing or decreasing aggregate supply are called supply-side policies. Examples of supply-side policies include increased spending on infrastructure, capital investments, both physical and human, investments in R&D, reductions in taxes on businesses, reducing regulation on businesses, and other policies that promote free trade, competition, and creativity or technological innovation. Policies aimed at increasing long-run economic growth may include public investments in the form of tax credits, grants, government contracts, or other monetary incentives. Unlike demand-side policies, supply-side policies do not require a trade-off between price levels and output. However, supply-side policies require more time to work. Reducing tax rates can increase both aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Reducing individual tax rates allows households to keep and spend more money, while reducing business taxes can lead to increased production, higher investment spending, and can encourage entrepreneurs to take risks. While reducing regulation on industries like pharmaceuticals or repealing environmental regulations on businesses would result in greater output, some economists argue that certain regulations are necessary. For example, Extensive deregulation of the banking industry contributed to the financial crisis and recession in 2007. In addition, some economists argue that reducing taxes could even increase tax revenue for the state. The Laffer curve shows a hypothetical relationship between income tax rates and tax revenues. At a tax rate of 0%, tax revenue is zero. And at a tax rate of 100%, tax revenue is also zero because there would be no incentive to earn income. Potentially, there is a specific rate, we'll call it Q, at which tax revenue is maximized. If the current tax rate is below Q, then an increase in the tax rate results in an increase in tax revenue. If the tax rate is above Q, then a decrease in the tax rate would increase tax revenue. The implementation of fiscal policy is far from easy, simple, and straightforward. There are many difficulties facing those who wish to implement fiscal policy, the first being the obstacle of collective decision-making. However, even if the Senate, the House, and the President were to fully agree on policy goals and strategies, and even if the general public were well informed on the political process, there are still problems related to the timing of implementing fiscal policy. For certain policies, timing is not as much of an issue 
Policies like a progressive income tax system and transfer payments, such as unemployment compensation, go into effect immediately. Such policies are referred to as automatic stabilizers because they require no overt action by Congress or other policymakers to take effect. In other words, there is no time lag. As an example, if the economy enters into a recession and workers begin to lose their jobs, those individuals can file for unemployment compensation, which will help to alleviate some of the effects of the recession. Under a progressive income tax, when workers' wages are cut, those workers will pay less in taxes under a new lower rate. Automatic stabilizers reduce the intensity of business fluctuations and help to smooth out the business cycle. In other words, make it less volatile. However, for discretionary fiscal policy, there are many timing lags. An information lag, a recognition lag, a decision lag, and an implementation lag. An information lag is the time that policymakers must wait for economic data to be collected, processed, and reported. Most economic data takes at least three months to make available. A recognition lag is the time it takes for policymakers to confirm that the economy is in fact in a recession, recovery, or inflationary growth period. It is difficult to interpret short-run economic data due to the fact that variations are typical and are often due to randomness. A decision lag is the time it takes for Congress and the current administration to decide on a policy once a problem is recognized. And finally, an implementation lag is the time that is required for a policy to go into effect and for the policy to have an impact on the economy. Some lags can be reduced by expediting spending already approved for existing programs rather than implementing new programs. Plans that have already been planned and approved are referred to as shovel-ready projects. Government failures also lead to less effective policies and often lead to inefficient outcomes in markets. Let's cover eight sources of government failure. The first being informational problems. Informational problems arise when self-interested constituents intentionally overstate or understate the value of public goods or of externalities in markets. Policymakers often make planning decisions based on inaccurate information or inaccurate signals. Second is the cost of government compliance. When governments impose regulations, market participants expend large amounts of resources in order to comply with policy. According to the IRS, individuals and businesses in the U.S. spend billions of dollars every year just to file taxes. The third source is government corruption and kleptocracy. When the level of corruption in government is high, as is the case in a kleptocracy, policymakers implement policies in an attempt to seek personal gain at the expense of the interests of the general public. The fourth source is called regulatory capture. In the case of regulatory capture, regulated industries have a strong incentive to influence the decisions of the regulatory body. Likewise, regulators are more likely to side with the regulated industry than with consumers. Under these circumstances, mutually beneficial arrangements made between the regulators and the industry that they are tasked to regulate results in a less competitive, more consolidated industry that prevents the entry of new firms and results in higher prices for consumers. The fifth source is rent-seeking. Rent-seeking is an attempt to manipulate government action in order to make oneself better off at the expense of others. As an example, domestic firms have a strong incentive to lobby hard for protectionist policies, like subsidies, tariffs, and import quotas, which result in higher prices for consumers and inefficient use of tax revenues. Rent-seeking behavior is a way for firms to compete in markets through the political process, rather than competing through innovation, prices, quality, or marketing. Rent-seeking can be thought of as a way for market participants to capture surplus from one group and add it to their own. The sixth source is log-rolling combined with rational ignorance. Log-rolling is the process by which a legislator votes to approve one bill in exchange for favorable votes from other legislators on other bills. When voters are rationally ignorant, that is, voters have a tendency to remain uninformed on matters of public policy due to the high costs and low benefits of staying informed, log-rolling can result in policies that benefit the few at the expense of the many. The seventh source is deadweight loss from taxes. Government spending must be financed in some manner, typically through taxation, 
It is well known by economists that taxes distort costs and benefits, and therefore influence economic choices. This comes down to the incentive principle, which in a basic sense means that you'll get more of what you subsidize and less of what you tax. When governments tax goods for which there are no negative externalities, often these are activities that we would actually like to see more of in society, the government generates deadweight losses, underconsumption, and higher prices. The final source of government failure that we'll cover is what I'd call collective hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic discounting is a time and consistent model from behavioral economics that provides an explanation for why individuals overly and perhaps irrationally discount the future and are strongly biased towards the present. In collective hyperbolic discounting, this concept is used to describe the behavior of a large group of people, perhaps an entire country or perhaps the entire world. I'm referring to a situation in which there is overwhelming support, both from policymakers and from the general public, for policies that provide instant gratification but bear significant, adverse, long-term economic consequences. Policies that provide large, immediate benefits to constituents, such as increased pensions, lower taxes, and huge government bailouts, provide obvious, tangible benefits to voters. And because of this, these policies are politically popular and results in re-election for government officials. However, these policies will later result in larger tax burdens and a high debt-to-GDP ratio, which could potentially result in a country becoming insolvent, that is, unable to pay its debts and unable to borrow more money, and at the same time, plunge a country into a deep recession, as was the case for Greece in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Hyperbolic discounting may be a satisfactory explanation for long-lived environmental problems as well, like climate change, and the trade-off that exists between higher economic growth today and irreversible environmental catastrophe in the future. It is the economic subfield of public choice theory that analyzes public and political decision-making, including voting behavior, election incentives, and the influence of special interest groups. When it comes to financing fiscal policy, governments have a choice of taxation or of borrowing. Public choice economists such as James Buchanan argue that governments have a bias toward borrowing and away from taxation, because when government borrows money to finance a policy, the perceived cost is lowered, thus making it more likely to be supported by taxpayers. When a government spends more than it collects in tax revenues in a given fiscal year, a budget deficit is incurred. Borrowing allows government expenditures to exceed tax revenues, and some economists argue that it is necessary to incur deficits to avoid long recessions and to stimulate economic growth in the short run. On the other hand, a budget surplus occurs when annual tax revenues exceed government expenditures. The national debt, or gross federal debt, is the total accumulation of past deficits minus past surpluses. Keep in mind that when the government borrows money, it also pays interest, and these interest payments are a part of mandatory spending each year. As of 2019, the U.S. national debt totaled over $22 trillion. A portion of the federal debt is held by government agencies, such as the Social Security Administration, the Treasury Department, and the Federal Reserve. As of 2019, intragovernmental holdings account for 26.5% of U.S. national debt. The rest of the debt is held by the public. As of 2019, public debt held in the form of U.S. Treasury securities by individuals, companies, pension funds, along with foreign investors and foreign governments, accounted for 73.5% of total U.S. national debt. And as of 2019, foreign entities and governments held 30% of total U.S. national debt. Debt held domestically is referred to as internally held debt, and debt held by foreign entities is referred to as externally held debt. When does a government, either at the federal level or at the state level, have to balance its budget? There are three rules or approaches to budget balances. Number one, an annually balanced budget under which expenditures and tax revenues have to be equal each year. While an annually balanced budget seems ideal at first glance, it leaves governments with a severe inability to implement expansionary fiscal policy during recessions, and many economists believe that these rules in the early 1930s made the Great Depression worse. Number two, a cyclically balanced budget. Under a cyclically balanced budget, the budget is balanced in sync with the business cycle, 
When the economy is in an expansionary phase, government restricts spending and raises taxes. And when the economy is in a contractionary phase, government increases spending and lowers taxes. A cyclically balanced budget is difficult to enforce and difficult to implement effectively due to time lags. Number three, functional finance. Under functional finance, the government is far less concerned with balanced budgets and instead pursues the primary objectives of promoting economic growth, stable prices, and full employment. This is the approach currently taken by the U.S. federal government. The obvious downside is that annual deficits are a regular occurrence, and this results in an ever-increasing national debt over time. I have a question for you. How does the government finance debt and deficits? The answer? The government can borrow money or sell assets. While it is technically possible for the U.S. federal government to go bankrupt, meaning a situation in which the government cannot pay back lenders or afford to borrow more money due to extremely high interest rates on bonds, there are two things to consider which make this event unlikely. First, the Federal Reserve can buy up bonds with newly printed cash. This injects money into the money supply, which causes inflation, but also keeps interest rates low, a process called monetizing the debt. This allows the federal government to continue to borrow money through the sale of new bonds. Without a central bank, if a government issues debt far above the amount of its perceived ability to pay, i.e. above the amount it could collect through taxes, bonds would be seen as a risky investment, and this would put upward pressure on interest rates. However, the Federal Reserve's ability to lower interest rates enables the federal government to continue to borrow at low interest rates that it can afford. Second, powerful governments are not like individuals or corporations who can have their property or assets repossessed by a creditor in the face of their inability to roll over debts. Should the U.S. federal government default on its debt, there is currently no organization or country powerful enough to seize the federal government's assets, and any such attempt would be an act of war. Despite these two factors, the U.S. still depends upon the public's willingness to buy additional government debt. The government's debt-to-GDP ratio can be thought of as a metric for determining the country's ability to pay off its national debt. At some point in the future, it is possible that the U.S.'s debt-to-GDP ratio could become large enough that the U.S. is no longer able to roll over its debt, and the public could lose faith in the government's ability to pay back what it borrows, i.e. to pay the annual interest costs. However, both the timing and likelihood of these events are uncertain. So while the government appears, at least for now, to be able to borrow extremely large amounts of money without the risk of bankruptcy for what could be a very long time, the government still faces what economists call a government budget constraint. A government budget constraint is given by the following formula. G minus T equals delta M plus delta B plus delta A, where G is government spending, T is tax revenues, G minus T is the budget deficit, and delta M is the change in the money supply as a result of the Federal Reserve buying bonds. Delta B is the change in bonds held by public entities, domestic and foreign. And delta A is the sale of government assets. The main idea is that the dollars used in deficit spending must come from somewhere, either from borrowing or from the sale of assets. Is there a limit to the effects that increased government spending can have on the economy? The answer is yes. One such limit is known as the crowding out effect. When the government borrows money to fund deficit spending, the demand for loanable funds increases. When this occurs, interest rates rise in the economy. When interest rates rise, this results in lower levels of consumer spending by households and lower levels of investment spending by firms, because the cost of borrowing is now higher. Thus, when considering aggregate demand, recall that aggregate demand equals C plus I plus G plus NX, it is possible for the increase in G to be partially or completely crowded out by a reduction in C and I. The crowding out effect is less pronounced during deep recessions or when government expenditures are used for public investment that result in long-run economic growth. On a final note, some economists argue that we should be concerned about the size of the national debt because long-run economic growth depends upon the fiscal sustainability of the federal budget. For a budget to be fiscally sustainable, the present value of all projected future revenues must equal the present value of projected future spending. If not, 
then future generations will end up paying for the spending of the current generation, causing intergenerational inequalities from heavy tax burdens that are passed down through time. This wraps up the lecture on fiscal policy and debt. I'll see you in the next lecture.